Okay, good morning, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. No, you cannot hear me. Let's see here. I can hear you, Corey. You can. We can hear you. Yeah, great. I got you, Corey. Great, great. All right. Well, let's get started then. So, um, a warm welcome to you all. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. And um, a special thank you to all of our panelists today for taking the time out of their day to share their, their work on this very important subject. Um, and since we don't have a whole lot of time, um, what we're going to do, I'm just going to give you some logistics of how this is going to work. Uh, what we're going to do is save all questions for the end. So if you have questions, please enter them. Um, anytime you think of them, enter them into the questions box. And if you have any um, comments or anything else that you want to talk about, um, you can enter those into the chat box. And you can also enter questions into the chat box too. Um, but since um, it can become unwieldy if we have everybody talk at once, we're just going to have to stick with the chat box. Um, and I am going to be uh, running this webinar and facilitating it. Um, so I will be doing all the behind the scenes work at the same time. So please bear with me as I, um, you know, kind of work with the controls here. Um, our agenda, let me see, I'm going to share the agenda here. And. Here we go. We're going to first hear from uh, from Holly Scarlett, who is joining us from uh, the city of Seattle in Washington. Um, we we asked Holly to join us um, special for this occasion um, because she um, has had a lot of experience on dealing with the issues of social equity and and flood um, mitigation and. So we, we thought it was a very important topic and I wanted to uh, bring in somebody who might not be from this area who might um, be able to share a little bit of insight on this topic. So uh, Holly is, is first on our agenda. So a warm welcome to Holly all the way from Seattle and it's like eight in the morning there. So <laughs> um, good morning to you, Holly. And I am going to Make you the presenter and uh, hear me a moment. Hey, Corey, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Because I had to call in for some reason, the computer itself wasn't working. Who's that? Demetra. Oh, Demetra. Okay. And let's see here. I'm getting a phone call from somebody else. So, what? Let me see what's going on here. All right, Holly, I'm going to let you go ahead and get started. OK. We can hear you. And if you can go ahead and share your screen. OK, let me know when you can see it. We can see it. Um, it's in. Um, we can see your notes slide. Excellent. Okay. Okay. All right. Cool. I'm going to turn myself off. Great. So, good morning or afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'm calling in from Seattle, and I appreciate being here this morning to talk about uh, what we have done with social equity in Seattle for flood control planning. Uh, I've been at the city for 14 years working at Seattle Public Utility in drainage and wastewater planning. And so I've had some experience as we've been approaching uh, the difference between equality and equity. Uh, and I'll take you through how we've looked at our city's uh, social and service inequities and the steps we've taken to bring equity into how we communicate with our public and also decision-making tools. So this is a picture that some of you may have seen. It's demonstrating the difference between equality and equity. Uh, if you look on the left side, 
uh, of the graphic, you'll see three people trying to watch a baseball game. We as government are trying to provide our services to everyone. So if we do that equally, we give each person one box and that should be enough to meet their needs. As you can see on the left side of this graphic, the tallest person was already able to see over the fence and the middle person is now able to see over the fence and the, and the smallest person still can't see over the fence. So three equal boxes is equal, but it is not taking their needs into account. So that's where we bring in equity, thinking about, okay, those three boxes can be distributed in a different way so that they can all reach the outcome that we're hoping they will. There's a new slide, a new graphic that I came across in the last couple of months, which is uh, showing that it's not just about the boxes. Um, the ground can be different, which kind of represents your beginnings. What income do you have to start with? What are your resources? Uh, what are the barriers? So the fence is slanted to show that everyone is in different situations that we need to think about when we're distributing our resources, our investments in what they need. So that's the difference, as we see it, between equality and equity. So when we're thinking about inequities, we, like everyone, we look at what are the risks and who is being impacted. Uh, if you can see, I put two pictures in of urban flooding. Um, one is from Virginia Beach that I saw online, and the that's at the top, and on the bottom is uh, a neighborhood in Seattle where a gym parking lot flooded. Um, the risks are, at least in Seattle, not obvious. Uh, it, we don't have giant rivers that flood. <clears throat> we have a lot of hardscape, a lot of impervious area and flash flooding. So it rains and then a lot of times we're surprised by where it's flooded. Um, so how do we find out about the risks? Well. Traditionally, what we've done is we wait for someone to complain. We wait for the alerts. Um, the police also call us to say there's flooding here and it's dangerous. Um, obviously, we know how to predict some, but we also have areas where it's just the perfect storm and the flooding happens. And we need to think about how do we know who's calling us? and how are they being impacted by the flooding? So a lot of times it's through claims and lawsuits that we find out, and sometimes the mayor tells us. So what we do try to think about are, what are the relative impacts? So I have shown you a screen. In the middle, there are two houses that were flooded equally, but we try to think about what are the relative impacts? what are the situations that the people living in these homes already have putting them at a disadvantage for when that equal flooding happens? Is it an equitable impact? Uh, they may not know that they can call the government to say that there's a flooding issue. They may not know that they can or should get flood insurance. They may not know that there could be a buyout program that could help them get reimbursed for uh, the cleanup, the property damage, the recovery. Um, they may have long-standing health issues that will now be impacted more, um, in affecting their mobility, affecting their um, breathing. So we are trying to think, like step back and think about what are the relative impacts, not all impacts are equal. They're inequitable. <laughs> uh, so the next slide I'm bringing forward is a, a weaving together of everything you just saw on the last slide. The race, English language learners and origins data, the socioeconomic disadvantages and the health disadvantages. Uh, I put uh, orientation on the bottom of the slide. We're the Pacific Northwest 
of the United States mainland. And I put a circle around Seattle and the image on the right is Seattle. And that's what we look at all the time when we're doing our planning. This is data that came from the US Census Bureau, American Community Survey, and public health agencies that uh, we pulled in from Esri and other sources. It's downloadable. It's easy to create this kind of map for your city. And it is then showing the composite. So all of those factors together create the colors on the, on the uh, map. So the highest disadvantage is magenta and the lowest is blue. And you know, typically that does translate to areas of the city where there are um, people that are uh, you know, people of color, are, are definitely seen as being in like an environmentally uh, hazardous area, uh, like near a Superfund site, uh, and maybe having a difficulty in speaking English, which makes it harder for them to report to us that there's flooding. So we use this as a starting point. It's not a way for us to say, we're only going to invest in the magenta and we're not gonna invest at all in the blue, right? That's not what we do. We just use it as a way for us to think in the shoes of the people that live in our city and what their impacts could be so that we know that it could be worse in some areas just based on what their baseline is. Okay, um, I pulled in uh, just a few pictures of some of our initiatives in Seattle. Let's kind of show you and demonstrate that it's easier once you have the organizational structure and the buy-in to be equitable. Uh, it's a shift from history and it's um, it takes a lot of effort. So if you do have organizations that, um, even not your actual government organization, but nonprofits in your cities or counties or states, uh, tap into those groups that are looking at race and social justice, uh, civil rights. Um, we're lucky enough to have equity front and center in, the, in our strategic business plans and our comprehensive plans for the city. Um, I highly recommend that if you can pick up, I think it's from PBS, Race the Power of an Illusion. That's a training course uh, that we have every single employee go through just to shift the way we're thinking. Okay, so building equity into our communications and our tools for making decisions about where to invest. Uh, definitely, uh, we start with the basics of asset management and data collection, uh, and that's where it starts. You can actually start thinking about equity early on when you're looking at your systems uh, you're looking at your um, assets uh, and you are able to uh, actually embed equity into how you make decisions on when you'll do inspections, your maintenance schedules, your repair and replacement schedules, of making it so that you're adding just a little bit more uh, emphasis in areas of your of your jurisdictions that need that extra help for the impacts that failure of our systems can create. Um, we do look at a variety of data sources. Um, we always looked at reported, and that was, again, what I said earlier, is sometimes it was the squeaky wheel. But then we are able, we've been able to put more investments in our hydraulic modeling proactive, predictive modeling so that we're looking at where do we think it will flood in our city um, using monitors, et cetera, to calibrate these models. And then we do outreach to verify that. Are people experiencing flooding the way we think they are? So that's the difference uh, from the past of just waiting to be called. So how do we, do this, uh, well, what we've done in the city of Seattle is we've taken a few approaches and um, we're using online tools like Social Pinpoint to ask our, our public in many different languages 
that um, are they can click on the buttons at the top so that they're getting into their language to be asked questions about the flooding in their neighborhoods. Uh, we hire liaisons that are already working closely with our communities to uh, take our message in with everything else that they're helping with. So for example, uh, Community Connections may be um, helping uh, new immigrants to our city acclimate and find out like where do you pay um, how do you pay your bills and things like that uh, and at the same time they'll ask where's your flooding right um, we've created language banks that are 24 7 uh, that are helping people when they call in be able to tell us what their problems are in their language um, and then we also have a racial equity toolkit that helps us think in the shoes of our stakeholders, the communities where we know there's a problem with flooding and are making decisions about how to reach out to the most people about that. Okay, and lastly, this slide is about uh, how we can bring equity into our criteria when we're looking at a basic risk formula of consequences multiplied by likelihood or frequency and then we add on an equity score so this may be a lot to look at and i can share it later but basically we're looking at the consequences of what are the impacts to properties how many properties are impacted in any given event uh, is it a problem to get to their properties because it's so flooded uh, we do look at the difference between parcels and roadway impacts. Uh, is there a critical facility like um, a hospital being impacted or blocked, et cetera. And at the far right, you'll see that there's a, an equity criterion and it is based on the social, the racial and social equity index that I showed you earlier. So you basically, you don't even have to think about it. You just look at the map, it, what color is the equity concern, and then you add a score based on that. And you'll see that your scores can go from anything from one to 30 points, and then we mapped it. So I'll show you on the next page. Okay, so this is the last slide. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, if you have questions, I will be able to answer them at a later time. But basically, I pulled together two images after we mapped our risk areas to show you the difference between when the equity score is included, which is on the left, and when the equity score is not included, which is on the right. So, when our uh, hydraulic modelers and our engineers and our, our decision makers and our utility were hearing about this, they were concerned that we would be adding all these new risks that were only in the equity concern areas and that we wouldn't be thinking about the highest, more acute risks. Well, that's not what happened. You know, basically, I put some circles around some areas that changed color based on the equity score. Uh, and basically, if you were in a lower disadvantaged area, your risk just got a little lightened. So the red is the more acute risk. And then when you get to green, that's, that's the least acute risk. So in the circled areas, yes, we had a change in color and, and the very lowest circle, you'll see that, oh, a risk showed up uh, once we added the equity score that just emphasized it, but didn't make it look acute. So it's just knowledge. It's a way for us to step back, think in the shoes of our public. Can a flooding risk get more acute um, for them if they're already at a disadvantage? So that's that's my presentation. I want to thank you all for inviting me and I'll be happy to answer questions in the future. Thank you. And now I'm going to try to stop the presentation. Or Corey can do it for me.
Okay, so thank you, Holly, for sharing that really great information. Uh, let me see, I'm gonna put my webcam back on. Okay, so as I said, I'm driving and facilitating at the same time, so bear with me. Um, so Holly, that was really great information. And if you guys have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out and, and we can put you in touch with Holly if you wanna discuss it further. Um, and we need to move right along on our agenda. So I'm going to hand the screen over to um, Katie Torgerson, who is a um, uh, environmental planner with Fairfax County. And she is going to describe the uh, Fairfax County flood strategy. And um, let me see here. Oh, I just, sorry, I was reading the chat box. Um, okay, Hall, or Katie, can you see the, the, uh, the screen share request? Yeah. Good, okay, great. All right, can you see me? Yep, we see your slide. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's not, we, yes, you wanna put it in the slideshow. Thank you. Um, so as Corey mentioned, I'm Katie Torgerson I'm with Fairfax County Department of Public Works and Environmental Services Stormwater Planning Division. I'm going to share with you um, the county's flood response strategy. Um, we're currently in the process of developing a flood mitigation plan, and we're looking into a number of different approaches. So I'm going to highlight some of the solutions that we may pursue. Um, still work in progress. The county would like to become um, more proactive rather than reactive and have a better understanding of what areas in the county are at a higher risk of flooding um, due to conditions like topography, um, where you have some conditions or a lack of overland relief, um, which the ability to pass a hundred year storm um, around a structure without flooding it. And in older neighborhoods you, where we may have um, no or an inadequate stormwater infrastructure. Um, we already have a lot of data and tools available um, in GIS to evaluate flood risk, and we'd like to build on those. Um, we have an effort underway to map minor floodplains between 70 and 360 acres, um, which are also regulated by the county along with the major floodplains like FEMA, but are often um, unmapped. And since urban flooding is so localized, we also are looking at different types of modeling, um, like rain on grid, to develop 100-year water surface elevations for smaller drainage sheds under that 70 acres. Um, we're looking into ways to assess and prioritize flood mitigation projects. More recently, we've been focused on the July storm event, um, that happened last year, but we have complaints in our database dating back to the late 1980s. So um, a lot of information to look at. And we'd like to use this information to create a more standard process for prioritizing these um, flood projects. Um, the county is looking at a variety of different ways um, to mitigate flooding. Um, that range in cost and levels of service. Um, each has its advantages and challenges. And we found really there's never one simple solution to address all flooding issues. Oftentimes we bundle efforts um, because what works for structural flooding won't work for uh, um, yard flooding or road flooding. And we've found it's particularly oops, difficult to um, retrofit stormwater management in the built residential environment there's a lot of um, a lot of conflict so we're looking for a way to compare costs and benefits and to really evaluate those different project um, alternatives um, additionally um, we may revise our stormwater regulatory requirements to better manage flood risk uh, we're looking at establishing a more detailed 
overland relief um, design requirements and potentially adding additional or adding freeboard to that as well. Um, updating development criteria, particularly in flood prone areas, and this may include um, restricting impervious cover or adding additional detention requirements. Um, we may further restrict development in the minor and major floodplains and or add additional freeboard um, on, on top of the 18 inches already required. Um, and we are establishing a residential single family infill detention policy um, that looks at requiring detention on individual lots um, up to the 10 year storm to um, on additional imperviousness. So um, we are trying to address the infill um, challenge as well. And also um, looking for ways to better incorporate climate change projections into the stormwater um, design requirements. Um, and that's an ongoing effort. And then all of these efforts cost money. So we are also looking to um, strengthen our partnership opportunities to maximize resources, looking at utilizing grants to potentially establish a voluntary buyout program to purchase repetitive loss properties, um, integrating flood mitigation into other county infrastructure projects like um, our road improvements and potentially developing a cost share program to fund stormwater management enhancements um, on private entities through the development um, or rezoning process. And we've also realized um, you know, the importance of education and outreach to the public on flood mitigation. Um, we'd like to better clarify the county's role in flood mitigation, um, what our levels of service are, where our limitations exist, and what are the limitations of our, um, of our infrastructure. And build on other regional efforts like the um, recent FEMA flash flooding outreach initiative um, in the region and um, also coordinate our messaging with other localities. It, it seems like we all have very similar challenges um, and aligning those messaging around that would be very helpful. Um, we're looking at identifying ways to make property owners and potential buyers more aware of flood risks on properties and, um, and definitely encouraging homeowners to buy flood insurance, particularly those located in more flood prone areas that are outside of that major FEMA floodplain. Um, and this, here is my contact information if you'd like to reach out directly and I look forward to hearing from everyone else. Here. Thank you, Katie. Um, please, uh, let's see here. I'm going to take the screen back from you and transfer it to Demetra. Change presenter to Demetra. Okay, so Demetra, you should have control of the screen now. Yes, we see your screen. And I can you can you talk? Can we hear you? Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, great. Um wonderful. Um there are going to be um, obviously some commonalities, particularly in this region, because we're all confronting the same um, challenges. Um, so moving right along, obviously, um, we're all working with programs that deal with capacity improvements in the infrastructure, also our water quality goals, as well as our regulatory requirements, and clearly maintenance capital. Um, a lot of us are dealing with infrastructure. I know that I can speak for Arlington, approximately 52% of our assets, our, our capacity assets, are between 60, um, uh, at least 60 years old and possibly older. Um, so again, we're looking at uh, a state of, of good repair. Um, 
And we're also looking at, again, very much like at Fairfax, public-private partnerships. So this is really telescoped for the uh, capacity approach and dealing with um, improvements and upgrades to our infrastructure, capacity infrastructure. So there's those improvements. There's, again, we're looking at development and redevelopment standards for resilience and risk mitigation. More on that soon. Um, and we're also looking for residential and commercial property owners to join with us in a public-private partnership. So clearly there are a lot of measures that people can take. Um, we're looking on our just generalized goal to be to keep the water out of people's, if not their yards, definitely out of their businesses and their homes, but there are also elements that, uh, and upgrades that people can do to their own structures that'll further harden them against intrusion, flood intrusion. Um, we've been doing a lot, particularly since July of last year. Um, the stormwater master plan has been in place and undergone many iterations since 1957. A major um, uh, project that we're doing right now is the RAMP, our risk assessment and management plan. Again, as you've heard um, from the prior speakers, that is going to have a number of deliverables. That includes new inundation. You know, it's an upgraded climate projection both for interior flooding as well as sea level rise because we do have a narrow area that is vulnerable to that but it includes um, very specific and very high level critical community facilities um, so we're going to have new inundation maps um, both 1 and 2d we're going to um, uh, there's going to be 13 vulnerability assessments um, for different watersheds and then we're picking three demonstrative um, watersheds for risk assessments. And those really measure, you know, it's a very wonky definition that we can talk about, you know, um, maybe offline or in another venue where there's more time. But that's essentially measuring the cost of an action. It's a fiscal and, and financial assessment. Um, so this is meant to be a multi-resource asset. It's also um, intended to be a very definite decision support tool. So we have a, a slide on that later. We did form at the direction of the county manager in November of last year, a stormwater interdepartmental working group that had four specific subject matter committees that were tasked with coming back to the county manager and ultimately the board. And we've also already started rolling these out, recommendations um, for both projects, policies, and programs. Um, we are, you know, definitely part of that has been really um, redefining the engineering approach. Um, like everyone else, we're dealing with very significant development. Arlington was um, in the 30s, 40s, and I believe the 50s as well, the fastest growing county in the United States. Um, there was significant development, some of it very dense. Um, so we're not taking on a blank slate um, as climate change really increases the intensity, the frequency, and the duration of storms here. So because we have a uh, limited space, uh, because we have significant underground infrastructure conflicts, um, and because unfortunately we have little to no overland relief in a lot of the critical watersheds, um, we've really had to approach a blended um, engineering um, strategy that uh, combines pipe upgrades with distributed detention, with voluntary acquisition of property to establish overland relief, and also expansion of the tertiary infrastructure. Um, I'll just slide because we're all dealing with FEMA. No more need be said on that. Um, uh, Jason Papakaz and his team have been hard at work for nearly two years, really looking at um, an update to the land disturbance activity program. These are going to include enhancements that develop, um, expand the developer options. It's going to streamline and um, leave streamline uh, templates, engineering templates and processes available to them, and also piloting new measures. Up until now, they've been focused almost exclusively on water quality um, on site and redevelopment. And now we're also adding uh, best management practices, BMPs that um, address qual uh, quantity as well, just because they're, again, it's very dense development and we want to control the um, runoff that is all too often happens in redevelopment. Um, our system asset inventory, the county already has a very, very detailed um, inventory. What it does lack is it doesn't have a grading or an age. So we've been hard at work over the past six months um, looking at development, adjacent development, 
and using the age of that development as a proxy for the age of the um, assets. Um, in terms of financing, we're looking at um, different ways to fund the program. So we have a utility feasibility study that's currently um, underway. Um, and we're also looking at capital project execution, redefining our, um, internally our project roles and responsibilities for timely um, and effective delivery of projects. This again is the risk assessment um, and management project. It has a number of applications. We're looking at this as the gift that keeps on giving. Um, and it's also going to help us measure the true value of investments, particularly when we get those detailed risk assessments. We anticipate that a lot of this information as it's delivered will be available online. We're happy to share that with any of our colleagues um, and as well as others. Um, the Stormwater Working Group. Um, again, I'm breezing through this pretty quickly. Um, there were four committees, as you'll recall, the Emergency Response and Life Safety Group um, delivered recommendations to the board through the county manager's report in February of this year. And there was a green light for two flood warning installations. Those are attached to main arterials. We had, um, as I'm sure a lot of our colleagues did, we had a number of uh, water rescues um, off of main arterials and roads last year on July 8th. The communications, um, we really had to re-envision the entire program through the lens of resiliency. So the stormwater program is now um, captured under the umbrella flood resilient Arlington. Um, that is a continuous effort for communication that continues to expand. Um, the two that are currently being finalized to take up to the county manager for his consideration are the strategic upgrades to the CIP and the engineering design, which I've talked about this, referred already to the hybrid design. Effectively, the board, um, informally the board and the county manager are very much behind that. So we're already implementing that in our conceptual designs for new projects. The one that is still being baked is this change of policy and redevelopment. And um, our, our colleague from Fairfax, mentioned a lot of that. It's nothing mysterious. It's really looking at a lot of the measures um, that are required um, in FEMA floodplains or looking at the credit um, elements um, under the, uh, the CRS program and really seeing if there's an, uh, an ability to incorporate some of those measures into our building and our zoning code. Um, we have, and I won't go into it, but uh, there were a number of measures that were undertaken back in the 70s and the early 80s by Arlington County that really alleviated significant flooding, repetitive loss in the southern part of the county. And you can see from this, we call it our heat map. Um, this goes uh, across several key um, historic storms, starting with the June 2006 storm. And you can see this kind of cluster and this concentration of real flooding problems, uh, both in their scope and their scale and their frequency in the northern section of the county. Um, and that kind of corresponds with a proposed CIP project um, schedule that we have. Um, this actually is uh, under uh, a bond, you know, the initial part of it for FY21 and 22 is really under a bond proposal that is going to be up for public vote. Um, on November 3rd as well. So you'll see these are watershed scale um, approaches and they're multi-phase. And this is just a sampling of the project list. Um, and you can see where there's property acquisition for overland relief. Obviously we're maintaining um, our water quality key projects and moving forward with that. The capital maintenance is of key um, uh, importance as well and we're looking to pair up with the city while well, we're already working with the city of Alexandria on the routine dredging of Four Mile Run. Four Mile Run, due to the rechannelization of it and the deepening of it back in 1982 to 1984, really allows for a large scale overland relief again in the southern part of the county. And here's my information um, in case you want it. And we look forward to you know, questions at the end of the presentations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Demetra. Um, let's see. So 
just a reminder, if you have any questions, to go ahead and, and enter them into the question box. And I am going to share the screen with Mark. Mark Avini from Prince William County is our our next speaker here. Thank you, Mark. Mark is, uh, I think, the Assistant Director for Environmental Services in the uh, Prince William County Department of Public Works. And I believe he's joining us from the emergency the EOC. operations. Yay. Yes, we are here. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Ready to go? Right. We are ready to go. We can only see a corner of your face, but I think that is okay if you want to scoot in the it's frame my best a little part. bit. My best part. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to turn myself <laughs> off and, and let you go ahead. So thank you, Mark. All righty. Good morning. I've got some folks here with me in our emergency operations center, um, and I'm going to go through our slides, which um, are probably more practical than theoretical. Um, some of the things we're seeing here locally that I'm sure you all are as well, um, you know, rainfall events seem to be increasing in severity. Uh, we're getting lots and lots of complaints uh, from residential um people mainly about house uh, flooding which is pretty serious as well as some yard flooding we have seen an uptick in claims against the county not all of them are paid out uh, but we are getting increased number of claims uh, we are legally responsible as, as a county where we have stormwater management or drainage easements and we do have a number of those as i'm sure you all do uh, we are increasingly getting drawn into conflicts uh, between vdot hoas neighbors uh, which take a lot of time and, and generally never end well. Um, and to be honest, we are fairly inconsistent in our easements uh, in older neighborhoods. We have a, a good process, I think, going forward. But back in the 80s and 90s, we have situations where there's an easement on one property and there isn't an easement on the adjoining property, and we can't really tell why that is. Uh, just a real quick example of an easement or a swale that we might have in one of our many new housing developments. You see that that uh, swale kind of in the middle, which is a grass swale. We do have restrictions on fences and trees and playgrounds and stuff, which is also a continual hassle. Uh, we walk these, we inspect them uh, yearly to make sure that they're functioning as designed. Typically, these easements might lead to a, a drop inlet kind of outside of the um, the picture there where, uh, you know, where the water would flow during uh, rain events. Um, we have had a lot of flooding and we had a Board of County Supervisors directive back in 2019. They asked us to look at some of our standards um, to make recommendations. We did. I'll share what we came up with. Uh, we held a lot of industry uh, meetings. Uh, we did come out and say that if we don't have an easement, the county really has no legal responsibility. However, that often doesn't go over well. So we do still offer to have staff come out and advise. And we have to be a little careful there. We have an inspector go out and say, you know, ma'am, sir, here's what you can do on your own. Um, you know, oftentimes we're asked to give recommendations on contractors. We have to be careful with that. Um, a lot of stuff is just property maintenance. You know, uh, your downspouts need to be extended. You need to, you know, maybe, um, you know, make a little trench here so the water goes. Maybe you need a French drain. Um, a lot of it is, is property maintenance, but sometimes it's more serious, and we do offer to do an improvement project. We have some standards that we're generally looking where it involves three or more properties, and there is an issue um, that, you know, probably should have been dealt with back at, at you know, uh, plan review. Uh, we do assume and we do tell people that if you were in a floodway, you're in a floodplain, you have waterfront property, we have lakes, we have rivers, we have the Aquan, we have the Potomac, uh, those properties will flood. And that's not popular sometimes to tell people that. But if you get a hurricane or a large storm event and you have flooding, um, you know, that that's supposed to be happening. Um, we do have dedicated staff that triages our complaints. About half of the complaints we get, we have a dedicated uh, phone line and email. I would say half or more are private matter, VDOT, HOA. Uh, but we do have a staff that can quickly discern that 
the last thing you want to do when you get a call or an email is have somebody wait a week and then a staff member comes back to them and says, sorry, you need to contact VDOT about that or sorry, contact your HOA. So we do try to triage those things fairly quickly. Um, and then if there are ones that we need to look at, we have drainage crews that can go out and inspect and if needed, um, you know, do improvements. So I mentioned that we saw some issues that we needed to upgrade our DCSM, and, and these are some of the things that we saw out uh, in the field, uh, runoff from large drainage areas flowing through some single-family lots, swales that I showed you earlier located too close to homes or home openings, which was causing flooding. Um, as has been mentioned, inadequate overland relief um, has been an issue. Our lot grading plans, which are what we use when we relieve the builder of all his or her responsibility, uh, we saw a lot of changes to those in terms of uh, the elevation, the way the basement walk out, or deviations that were done by homeowners, um, swales that, that don't have enough slope so the water literally does not flow, um, and then inadequate positive drainage away from um, foundations. I think these are probably pretty typically seen in our area, but this is where we were having um, a lot of issues. I think most people on this call would be familiar how drainage works. Um, this is just an example of showing uh, lot lines and high points and how water is supposed to flow. We've all gone out and looked at examples of homes where um, this isn't occurring, but this is what our lot grading and our plan review process is supposed to do. Sometimes there's a disconnect between what our plan reviewers see on a piece of paper and what's happening out in the field uh, that our inspectors would see. We are trying to get our plan reviewers out in the field a little bit more to, obviously they're not gonna look at every lot grading, but to look at things out in the field um, a little bit better so that we can uh, reduce some of the problems that we're having. I've got some pictures. Here's an example, typical subdivision. Um, the water went into the entryway there at the walkout basement. There's really no threshold. There's really very little stopping that water from going into that basement. Um, you've got um, you know, downspouts and, and water coming to this point. We probably should never have approved this uh, the way it is. Uh, you've seen these, the flooded rear yard, the AC units, the basement. Uh, this is bad. This is bad. This is in a newer home. These people had been in there maybe less than two years. Uh, this shouldn't be happening. Uh, drop inlet, handling a large flow. Uh, the overland relief for this was, unfortunately, the basement. Um, and this is what it looked like. You see that kind of black, the red table there. You see behind it is the uh, the sliding door. And that black thing about halfway up is, is water. Uh, that's how high the water was against that glass. And you see it seeping in, and then eventually it broke the glass. And, you know, God forbid a, a kid was sleeping in the basement or something. Um, you know, this is, this is serious. Uh, large drainage area, about 50 acres, dedicated, to, directed to a ditch next door to a house. Again, new subdivision. This was still on bond. This was still on bond. This was back in 2019 when we had all the, the, the rainfall. And this is one of the things that prompted our board to issue uh, a directive. Another example, uh, just, you know, unacceptable, uh, makes us look bad. Um, here's kind of a, a very common thing. We, we've got drop inlets throughout the county. Um, this is in a guy's backyard. You see what he did. He fenced it out, so he's never looking at it. Um, this clogged and caused flooding. So, you know, whose responsibility is that? Uh, we clearly say that it is a homeowner's responsibility to maintain things in their yard. Um, he's not looking at this because he's on the other side of the fence. Uh, we do do flood checks. We have our staff going out and do flood checks, and they'll look, um, you know, and see things like this before storm events to um, the greatest extent they can. But they can't, you know, they can't be everywhere. So this this is a homeowner responsibility. We've talked about public outreach, public education. Do folks know that that's their responsibility? Sure, it's in a document somewhere that they signed when they bought the house, but a lot of times, um, you know, they're, they're simply not aware that they need to go out there and, and maintain this drop inlet. Um, this is one just from a last storm event. We have a lot of private driveways with corrugated metal pipes underneath them that are failing. They've reached their limit of, of 30, 40 years, whatever it is. This particular instance was pretty dramatic um, and is going to be very expensive to fix. 
it serves uh, some higher end homes and there's probably four or five houses that are not able to access their property um, and they want us to fix it. And obviously there's no, uh, well, not obviously, but there is no easement. There is no dedicated um, uh, responsibility on the part of the county. And this is going to be, you know, a fair amount of money. And the residents are reaching out to supervisors and saying the county needs to help us. And we have said, well, you know, if we start doing it here, we're going to do it everywhere. Um, so, so far, we've, we've said no to things like this. But um, this is becoming an issue that, that needs to be um, addressed. Um, so uh, we did uh, recommend some changes to our DCSM. They were not easy to get, um, but we did restrict maximum overland flow uh, to two CFS with residential lots, half acre or less. Uh, the second one there was very controversial. We are now requiring swales at least 15 feet from the rear of the dwelling. Um, we spent two or three board meetings and planning commission meetings arguing with 12 feet, 15 feet, was it my recommendation? Was it industry's recommendation? Uh, but finally, we got 15 feet from the rear of a dwelling. Recognize that w with a swale like that, you're limited in terms of what you can do with a deck, with a patio. So many homeowners were paying a lot of money for nice houses, and they couldn't even have you know a decent sized deck because they were putting these swales, you know, 10 feet or less from uh, from the back of their their house. So that one was, I think, a success. Um, we proposed and were passed some, some overland relief um, methods there. I won't go into great detail, but basically to um, look at the lowest opening point in a dwelling, like I showed you earlier, the basement areaways and so forth, um, so that that water was not going into the house, but the overland relief was around the house. Um, and then we did a builder's lot grading inspection readiness checklist, which showed that they had looked and signed off on all these things prior to us giving um, a certificate of occupancy. And again, these were um, ultimately passed, but they were not um, a slam dunk. We had to go to many meetings and participate in many uh, industry meetings to get these things finally passed. I guess a couple closing thoughts. You really can't just say it's an act of God. We cannot ignore the flooding that we're seeing. Um, it is happening, whether it's climate change or poor development practices, uh, it doesn't matter. We have to be able to propose something. And so we're trying kind of hard here to look at what we can propose to prevent this kind of flooding. Uh, we're doing a good job keeping our elected officials informed. They don't like to be obviously caught unaware and have citizens call them in the middle of the night. We are developing guidelines for when we do and do not get involved. It can't just be somebody called the right person and that generates a visit. Um, we visit every person who makes a complaint. And as I said, even if you don't have an easement, you'll get a visit from one of our inspectors who are very good and very highly trained and they will offer some guidance and that seems to generally help a fair amount. Uh, we have bought out one property in all the years here. We purchased one repetitive loss property with some FEMA money. Um, it was a, a lower income property along Bull Run. Uh, the person was in a situation where the money worked for them, you know, depending on their mortgage and, and home equity, it gets a little sticky. But we did buy out a ha house, we raised it, and now it's just uh, open space for the county. We do think those programs are good in older communities. You talked about equity and, and lower income communities. I think um, that can work. Uh, but of course, a lot of those people in that situation aren't really interested in leaving, interestingly enough. I just thought that was something I would share. We've approached a lot of lower income, non-native English speaking people, and some of them are kind of okay with it, interestingly enough. They, they don't want to move. Um, we are looking at a small program in each district where we can have um, improvements to be made. So even if you don't have an easement, if we can have two or three houses that together need something, uh, perhaps we'll offer an improvement that can be made, and then we'll take an easement and therefore um, you know, manage it from here on out. Um, and then, again, I'm enjoying this. If you have any questions, you can certainly email me. We have a great staff here, Raj Badari, Ben Ive, Mark Caldwell, as well as Brian Misner with our um, emergency operations that works together um, on this. And that's my presentation. Okay, thank you, Mark. And um, I am taking back my screen. And I'm going to hand it to Bill. Bear with me one second.
change presenter to Bill Kane. Yes. Okay, Bill Kane is the new presenter. All right, let me see what we can do here. Get the right screen set up. I think we're gonna get Maggie Hour to do the presentation for this. Okay, uh, we do not see your screen yet. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, we were going to get, uh, we were going to have you uh, make Maggie Hour the presenter, and then she and I were going to run through our little presentation here. We could get you to do that. Okay, I just made the, made the presenter Maggie. Okay. All right, we see you now, Bill. Gotcha. And I still see Mark there. Okay, Mark, I'm so, going to turn you off. Oh, you have to turn yourself off, I think. There you go. Okay, so we see you, Bill. Okay. We are waiting to view Maggie's screen. There, there we go. Did. All right. All right. We see both of y'all there. And um, awesome. if you want to change the format of your screen, because we see the um, the next slide on there. Okay. Let's see. Sure. So good morning, everybody. I just want to go ahead and do the introductions. I'm Bill Kane. I'm the Natural Resource Program Manager in Loudoun County. And with me today is Maggie Hour, the Floodplain Program Administrator. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, our current um, ongoing flood mitigation project uh, that we have in Loudoun County. Uh, so back in 2002, FEMA issued some maps to us. In Loudoun County, we have major and minor floodplain. We base all those floodplain boundaries on what is presented on the FEMA maps. So in 2002, FEMA gave us uh, a FEMA map that showed a sliver of minor, what we call minor floodplain or shaded zone X uh, in an area of the county. And in 2005, a developer came in and wanted to develop that into a uh, little subdivision. Well, in 2005, they did their study. Their study redelineated the floodplain boundary and it didn't, it didn't defer that much from what had been previously shown in the FEMA mapping and what we had as our minor flood. So uh, the processes went through, the subdivision was approved, roads were located, houses were located, and in 2013, uh, development came in, the homes were built. Um, and oddly enough, as soon as the houses went in, interesting things started happening. We started to have some flooding events. We had flooding events in 2013. 2015 and everyone knows 2018 how wet that year was um, and after the 2015 event and around the 2000 before the 2018 event one of the homeowners contacted um, then representative Barbara Comstock who contacted FEMA and through some conversations with them they wanted to redelineate or, or put out a new map so in 2019, we actually got a letter of map revision from FEMA that was a approximate A zone for a large area. Well, that incorporated about 25 lots. Uh, and I believe it was like 15 houses at the time. So uh, after that, we contracted with a third party in a data to a floodplain analysis, a watershed analysis to figure out exactly what was going on and where the floodplain boundaries were. They conducted LIDAR and, and a very extensive 2D um, HECRAS model and uh, developed a hydrologic model and their own hydrology came to, uh, uh, to us. We, we've got a full, very detailed analysis and we submitted that to FEMA and in what uh, very recently they issued 
a new FEMA map. Uh, it's a letter map revision with um, uh, base flood elevations, cross sections, and all that good stuff. So now we've done elevation certificates. We found out uh, exactly how many houses may still be in, and to the degree that they're in the floodplain. Um, let's see, Maggie, next slide. And so basically, we're going to work through some potential uh, property acquisitions. I'll let Maggie talk about that. Sure. Thanks, Bill. So in 2019, as Bill mentioned, uh, FEMA did a LOMAR that was completed and resulted in changes to the uh, special flood hazard floodplain boundary. So as a result of that 2019 remapping, and the reoccurring flooding that was happening in the area, our board directed staff to look into establishing a voluntary buyout program. The board also later directed us to apply for flood mitigation grants that would allow for the acquisitions of the homes, as well as some additional localized flood mitigation improvements for other eligible homes in the subdivision. Uh, this is the first time that Loudoun County has attempted any kind of acquisition due to flood damages. And we've also never had a buyout program prior to this. Um, so this is all new to us, this whole process. Um, but in addition to the buyout, we did have to look into some different alternative solutions to the flooding. Uh, so we considered three other projects, uh, a berm, Installing that was one of the options, increasing the carrying capacity of the current existing stormwater infrastructure and uh, constructing a stormwater pond. But in the end, uh, these alternatives were not chosen because they don't completely eliminate the risk of flooding to the homes. We ultimately went with the buyout program and that was what was recommended to the board because it was the most viable flood mitigation option uh, that removed all risk of structural flooding. So currently we are in the process of applying for a federal grant to help with the acquisition and the mitigation for the eligible homes. We looked into four potential grant opportunities um, that included the hazard mitigation grant program, the new brick program, Virginia Dam Safety Flood Prevention Fund, and the flood mitigation assistance grant. So there were a couple of reasons we decided not to go with certain grants. Uh, some of them included that you needed a disaster declaration for the funds to be released, uh, or the grant was typically more for larger scale infrastructure projects. And in some cases, acquisitions weren't eligible due to the uh, funding restrictions for this particular grant period. So we ended up going with the flood mitigation assistance grant uh, we worked with the Virginia Department of Emergency Management, or VDEM, and they recommended the um, FMA grant to us because acquisitions are an eligible project under the grant. So because our project in part takes into account acquisitions, we thought we would be well positioned to be competitive for this uh, award. So the notice of funding uh, went out uh, in August and we have been working to compile the grant to get it to VDEM by November 10th. So at this point, uh, the scope of the project is 14 homes. Um, they were determined to be susceptible to flooding by a third party engineering firm and the staff has been working with the homeowners for three possible options they can be bought out, uh, participate in localized improvements and remain in their homes, or they have the option to not participate at all. It's not mandatory. So in order to be eligible at all, if they wanna get any of funds, should the grant be awarded, all the homeowners that are interested need to carry uh, a flood insurance policy through the National Flood Insurance Program. And that has to be effective as of September 30th. So as of tomorrow. We uh, spent a lot of time working with the homeowners, trying to clarify what policies they had and through who to make sure that they would be eligible should we get the funding. Um, additionally, the grant is very competitive. And so the more benefit the project has, the more likely it is to be selected uh, by FEMA. 
So we've been trying to make sure that we have a high benefit cost analysis result, which would allow us to have a more favorable ranking in the application uh, when the state sends it to FEMA. So where are we at now and what's next? Right now we are working with the homeowners as well as other county departments in order to finalize the grant application. Uh, we are working on finalizing the scope and the budget, as well as all the variables that go into the benefit cost analysis table. We are, like I said, trying to submit to VDEM in November, November 10th. And then once we submit it to VDEM, they will review it and provide it to FEMA in January or early next year. So we're looking at potentially some kind of award date, December of 2021 or January of 2022 at which point we are going to move forward with the project depending on whatever the results are uh, of that award. And that's just a little overview of our floodplain management project we're doing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we'll have some questions. Um, so please um, feel free to continue asking questions in the chat box. And I accidentally skipped over Brian in from Alexandria. Um, so I apologize for skipping over him on, in the agenda there. Um, that's what happens when your seven-year-old comes in and asks you for some eggs and vinegar randomly. I'm like, what do you need that for? Um, so I am now going to share the screen to Brian. Brian uh, Ray Hall is a civil engineer and section lead for the stormwater management division um, for the Department of Transportation and Environmental Services for the city of Alexandria. There we go, now we see you. We can't hear you. Let me see here. Okay, Brian, can you, can you attempt to speak? No, no, we cannot hear you. Let me check the audio. Can you uh, just make sure you're not on mute on your end? <laughs> okay. Let's see here. I'm unsure why we cannot hear Brian. And I am going to try and troubleshoot a few things in the background. And so I guess in the meantime, I'm going to put Norm on. Will I troubleshoot a few things here? Try, try to see if Jessica can uh, uh, be heard. She may, she may know this as, as just as well. Okay. 
Be there. We'll put Jesse on the spot. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. Although it sounds like you're in a bar. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm not in a bar. Okay. That's all right. Let me okay. share my camera. I had to turn teams what? off. I think that might have been interfering. Can you still hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. We just don't right. see, we do see your screen. How's that look? Yeah, there we go. Okay. You just might want right. to change the little, format. Sorry about that little snafu. Let's go to full screen here. Let's see if that, nope, that, no notes. How do I close that? Uh, uh, sorry, this this is confounding me for some reason. Maybe under display settings. Can you see my my? Uh, can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. We can see your presentation. It just has a little uh, sidebar that shows the next slide coming up. All right. Let's see here. Oh, that must be. Uh, that must be the Brian, webinar. Go back to the Brian, go back to the presentation and click on the display properties. It'll you can change that style. Display properties. Is that, did that change anything? No. This is all kind of new to me, guys. Sorry about this. It's okay. I'm not quite sure how to change that once it once it's in uh, go to webinar. I mean, it looks, oh, I see display settings. Here we go. Well, we can, we can. Ah, uh, okay. I think I got it now. Okay. All right. Sorry about all this. All right. We're good. No worries. You take it away. Okay. So what I thought, you know, since we had recently gone to council for, um, Letting, letting them know what we're planning to do for um, flood mitigation efforts in Alexandria. I would just run through a few of those slides uh, to give you an idea. So we had a council work session last, uh, a week ago, last Tuesday, um, actually a week ago today on September 22nd, where we were looking at um, some of the problems in Alexandria, of course, the big events that we've had recently, um, and I think some of you didn't experience the most recent one, was very localized. Uh, it all seemed to start in 2018 when we got 70 plus inches of rain, several 20 year storms during that period. July 8th, 2019, July 23rd this year, uh, again in September 10th, um, all three of those were anywhere between two and a half and four in, to four inches within 30 minutes to an hour, uh, which completely overwhelmed most of our old storm sewer system uh, in many areas, uh, even outside of the floodplain areas. So during the work session, we uh, really have everything is on the table, uh, a reprioritization and acceleration of capital investments. Um, there seems to be uh, an interest uh, in discussing what it would take to move um, some capital investments in water quality to more 
uh, funding of uh, capacity projects. Uh, we're looking at uh, establishing an interdepartmental strike team, so to speak, uh, to uh, consolidate some efforts and uh, between departments uh, on uh, flood mitigation. And we're also looking at providing some immediate assistance, expanding our sewer backflow prevention program, as well as uh, establishing a special city grant program to aid with future flood mitigation. So an action plan. We have investment areas uh, in our capital program. Uh, the first is a City of Alexandria storm sewer capacity analysis, or CASCA, which began in about 2009, ran through and finished uh, in 2016. We have a full XB swim model of all uh, citywide of all the storm sewers. Um, we have uh, problem areas identified. We have projects uh, and solutions also identified uh, and a partial prioritization and cost estimates uh, from that in 2016. We're working on updating those numbers and the prioritization uh, so that council can uh, be a little more informed. Um, our spot improvement project, capital project, um, is something that, that we do on a complaint basis. Um, we need to prioritize those as our, our project list grows um, and look at uh, continual uh, addition of, of more funding to, to fund all those projects. Uh, stream and channel maintenance. Um, it, it, we have several flood control channels surrounding the city in Fort Mile Run, Cameron Run, and uh, parts of Hoofs Run down on the south end um, of the city, and Holmes Run running through uh, the central west of the city. Uh, those need to be maintained to maintain capacity. Uh, and additional water quality projects uh, to meet our bay mandates. Uh, those are our main four investment areas for stormwater management. So for the CASCA project, um, just to give a few highlights, um, we're looking at uh, currently about seven and a half million uh, in the four-mile run and hoops watershed uh, to make investments. Um, we're looking at just the 10-year standard to bring these areas up to carrying the 10-year storm in Alexandria. Uh, we have our own uh, IDF curve, which um, is a bit more conservative than some other surrounding jurisdictions. But again, uh, just the 10-year storm, these areas would still flood given the three storms that we had that I mentioned in the last two years. So is this the right design standard? That's something that we're gonna to have to get direction from the city manager and city council on whether or not we change those policies. Um, we're looking at accelerating some projects and uh, possibly shifting to water quality funding to water quantity. This is an interesting heat map. This is a heat map of calls from the, um, I believe this is the July 23rd storm. It may be, it may be September 10th. I think this was updated. Um, so it's, uh, it, yeah, okay. Jesse, just let me know it was updated for September 10th. Um, so the, these are the uh, complaints that we've received. Uh, for that event, and the blue dots are our proposed projects uh, from the CASCA analysis. So they seem to align a, a little bit. So our spot improvements are, are looking at adding inlets, changing inlets to uh, a graded, raised grade inlet, as you can see these in these photos. Uh, we're looking to get some more funding from council to accelerate some of those projects. Stream and channel maintenance, uh, Holmes Run, Cameron Run, Hoops Run, Backlick, Taylor, and others. Uh, four mile around flood control project. We're still in the core program for that particular flood control project. And uh, incidentally, this photo here is Cameron Run, <clears throat> just upstream of the 495 uh, Beltway. It almost, um, I believe this is July 8th last year 
it almost overtopped the beltway. Um, so we're also looking at expanding our maintenance capacity. So increasing uh, FTEs, a mix of reactive and preventive maintenance. Um, we have uh, a three, city 311, Alex 311 system where folks can let us know what and where things are going on uh, so that we can catalog complaints. In throughout this year, we've received over 500 requests uh, through the city's 311 system. Uh, which is a challenge for our small little city. Uh, the Hoops Run Culvert is an interesting entity. Uh, it, uh, Hoops Run was an old stream that was piped uh, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And there's 1,200 acres. I'm not really reading this slide for you, but it's 1,200 acres that drains to uh, two box culverts that go underneath the railroad tracks. And there's just not enough capacity to get these bigger storms through there. Three to four inches in an hour, it's going to flood the floodplain. So we're also looking at some immediate aid, local and state federal. Um, so we have a backflow, backflow preventer program where we will reimburse up to $2,000 uh, for a backflow, uh, backflow valve. Uh, we're also looking at uh, the federal BRIC and uh, FMA, Flood Mitigation Assistance Program. Uh, we're looking at uh, Flood Mitigation Pilot Program, including public-private partnership, local grant program, and other initiatives, uh, maybe some tax relief, uh, and uh, stormwater utility credit. Um, so we're looking for folks to uh, take action on their own um, to protect their property in some areas that would be helpful. Um, you know, door barriers or window covers for their basement windows, those kind of things can really help. Um, one interesting thing that we're expanding is our uh, rainfall data and uh, flood warning system. We're going to add six rain gauges in our little city and uh, give a front-facing uh, uh, portal so that folks can see what's going on for themselves. Uh, and hopefully that will raise awareness and help people get a little more prepared, uh, especially when the National Weather Service is late with a, uh, with a warning like they have been a couple times this year. So the policy decisions that we're faced with is uh, changing some regulation policies. Uh, are we going to do that? So we're, we're evaluating our situation, whether or not that will help um, in all of these areas where quality, quantity, floodplain management, green infrastructure, stormwater management, master plan. Uh, so we're also considering uh, more stringent requirements, a range of uh, public and private options. Um, so we're exploring uh, sort of larger projects with, uh, with public-private uh, entities to help out with uh, overland relief or uh, storage, that kind of thing. So we're looking at a couple takeaways. Um, I won't go through this whole slide for you, but um, if you have any questions, uh, just let me know. And we're asking, we're trying to raise awareness and asking folks, you know, what can they do now? Realizing that, that the city isn't the most reactive entity to, to these types of situations, um, that there are things that they can purchase for themselves, the, the backup flow, backflow preventers, door barriers, uh, even, um, the flood logs that you can get at Home Depot. And most people don't know that those things are available. Um, and so if we raise awareness, uh, people can take matters into their own hands and, and hopefully begin to protect their own property, not relying on the city to do something immediately. So our next work session is coming up and we'll be discussing all of these things with them. Uh, so. 
and that's it. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, thank you, Brian. Sorry about the uh, technical difficulties in the beginning yeah, there. Yeah. Did I get everybody on the agenda? So we went through, let me go back to the agenda here. I'm gonna take your um, screen back to me. Okay. And uh, let's see, you should be able to see my screen now and I'm gonna turn you off. Ryan. Just give me a moment here. All right, sorry folks for hanging in there with me. And I believe we have some questions here that I'm, I'm going to read to you all. And let me just get them to a point where I can see them. I don't know why it's so tiny. Okay. First question, uh, it says, Brian, are you considering your own stream gauge solution or partnering with the National Weather Service or the G USGS? And let's see, Brian, are you able to respond? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're, um, we're going to have everything available uh, that, uh, that can tie into the alert to uh, communication network. Um, so that'll be available to the National Weather Service and anyone else like Fairfax County or uh, Arlington that uh, have their own gauges. Okay, uh, it's the data from those gauges going to be in, in real time available like on, on your website or anything like that? Yeah, we're going to try and get to as close to real time sharing uh, live uh, yeah, on some sort of a portal. Um, mm -hmm. So, yes. Okay. All right, for Mark in Prince William County, Mark, are you still there? Okay, can you, sh Mark, can you share the checklist that you referred to with all the other jurisdictions? Call me, but I can and send it to you, uh, Corey. Okay. You want me to send it, Great. send it to you? Yes, you can send it to me and I'll, and I'll um, send it out to all the attendees. Okay. And also, um, there's a related question for you, Mark. How do you track all of your easements? Do you have them in a GIS layer or a database of some type? Yes, we have a GIS uh, layer called County Mapper, which is actually pretty good. Um, and on it, there's a number of different uh, layers that you can put on. And we have one for our stormwater management infrastructure. And it's actually very easy because any staff member can go in, enter an address, enter a G pin, and you can see that property and see if there's um, ease. So you can do it from your, you know, from your desk. So okay. GIS County Mapper. Okay, great. Um, and then I have a related question too. Um, do you encounter a lot of encroachment on your easements from the public that maybe don't realize that they have an easement on their property, like sheds or garages or every, fences? Yep, every week. Yeah, every week we do. Yeah, they're supposed to come in and get a form filled out from us for permission to to go in an easement, but often they don't. Um, sometimes it's harmless. Sometimes it's more serious. We've had some issues where they put in, you know, expensive sheds or, or other stone patios, and then we have to go in and ask them to remove them. Uh, so, yes, happens all the time. And then who's who pays for that if they have to be removed? 
Is that the county? Uh, they or do. Is that the um, the yeah, no, they, they put it in our easement. They have to pay to remove it. Now, in full disclosure, there's been a couple instances where, unfortunately, zoning has given approval to individuals to put in things in, in a floodway. Um, and those are kind of negotiated, but but I never pay because I didn't approve it. So it's it's a little uh, touchy. Okay. Um, all right, I think that's it for Prince William County. Uh, let's see, the next question from Heidi Bonifan with um, the Metro what, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. She says, hello, I'm curious whether resiliency planners are currently in close coordination with departments that deal with development planning. COG members have pledged to increase housing stock over the next 10 years, but that might put added pressure to develop in areas where development shouldn't occur, whether via infill adding to imperviousness or whether in floodplains. Updated maps of no development areas seem needed. Corey? Yes, it's Demetra. Really quick, Arlington County, one of our the one of our committees under the cross departmental group, um, is looking at policy and ordinances. So, for the last six to eight months, we've been working quite closely with a number of different departments, including our our building and our community development department. Okay. So do you think that there are maps of no development areas that might be necessary? I'm going to leave that question to others. We're so small that really, um, you know, the county back in the 70s purchased all the floodplains and for open space and parks. So there's really not much left that isn't already developed maybe you know looking in the future in a 2050 vision on maybe that development changes somehow in the zoning but okay. that's just theoretical we haven't really socialized that um in any specificity with our department but it's just that we're so constrained so i'll leave it to others that have maybe more room Okay, well, if nobody else wants to chime in, um, we'll move on to the next question, uh, which is also from Heidi. So the, the two funding mechanisms that have been repeated are the FEMA grants and also public and private. Can anyone give it examples of a public-private funding mechanism that you are exploring or that have worked? So I believe, Dimitri, you, you talked about a public-private funding mechanism and also uh, Katie in Fairfax. I'm going to defer to Katie because I think our, our public-private partnership now, I'm not saying that it won't evolve into more areas, but right now we're really encouraging, educating and encouraging building owners, both residential and commercial, to familiarize themselves with measures that they can take to harden their properties. Katie, do you, can you unmute yourself? Do you have anything you want to add of anything from Fairfax? Sorry, I was, I was muted. Um, so, you know, we've generally focused our efforts, you know, from the stormwater planning side in, in public areas, but um, we are looking at um, the possibility of, you know, partnering with developers as they come in, um, particularly in redevelopment areas with known flooding issues to help fund maybe, you know, an expansion of an underground detention facility or some other 
quality control practice that they're putting on their their property. So they'll have commitments, you know, to follow to meet regulatory requirements. Um, but we could go in and help um, help fund any expansion of that. And it, it's something we haven't really done in the past, but we are looking at doing that um, in the future. Okay. All right, I'm going to look in the chat box here now. Okay, regarding insurance, local agents advised the public in our stormwater forums last October that basements and subgrade levels are excluded from flood insurance. That is the site of much of the building damage in Arlington County. What about others? I'm unmuting all of you. So anybody who wants to talk, just unmute yourself. Demetra, do you uh, care to add on to that question? Um, yeah, uh, we did have following the July 8th storm, you know, obviously there was a, a strong reaction from the public um, throughout the county. And we did have technical forums that were at the very end of September and beginning of October. And we did include insurance on that. So we did have the deputy director of the state um, insurance there as well as representatives from uh, regular insurance companies like Allstate and First, you know, uh, State Farm, et cetera. And at least in our area, um, basements and subgrade levels are excluded. Um, and we found out about this, why we had the insurance people there at the forums, because we had a number of, um, of residents that were really desperate for some relief and they had all been turned away by claims that they filed on their homeowners insurance because again uh, obviously a lot of the a lot of the damage was done to um, subgrade garages and and basements that were being used as living area and housed the kind of building systems like furnaces um, so there was significant damage there and uh, the fine print said that they were excluded so so is that from homeowners insurance or from the government subsidized flood insurance? No, from regular homeowners um, insurance um, and also for businesses as well. Because I don't know, and this is an interesting question for others. I mean, across the United States, it seems like the trend has been that 70 to 80% of the extreme flooding in places is, is in urban flooding areas, not in the FEMA floodplain. Um, so that's, literally where the majority of our, you know, extreme flooding and significant repetitive loss is occurring. Right. So do people do people understand that they can purchase flood insurance when they are not located in a floodplain? Yes, they do now. But I'm saying that's something that you've got to really go out and educate your public on. Right. Okay, I get it. So yeah, most people think that flood insurance is only necessary for people that live like right next to a river or next to the ocean or in an area that floods on a regular basis. And I know in Arlington, there was a lot of flooding that occurred, you know, Victoria, on areas that- I have a couple comments on this. Sure. Uh, this Go is ahead. Brian Rowling, Alexandria. Um, I'm also the floodplain administrator for the city. Um, there is fine print in all of the National Flood Insurance Program insurance policies that say uh, coverage in basements is limited. And basically all that you can get uh, coverage on is like a hot water heater, a washer, and a dryer. Um, everything else is, is not covered. Okay. 
So that, that became apparent to us also um, after the July 8th, 2019 storm and all of the investigations that went on for that. Yeah, was that Graham? That, that was our experience in Arlington too. Yeah. It's a number of reasons why looking at maybe new development and redevelopment policies, you know, the potential for that is helpful. Agreed. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, I'm going to let Norm um, go ahead and kind of wrap things up. And um, if you if something comes to mind, feel free to, to post it in the chat box. We'll, st we'll still be here for another few minutes. I'm going to give it to you, Norm. Well, actually, Norm, do you have anything you want to share on your screen? Otherwise, you can just talk. No, I don't have anything on the screen, Corey. Um, okay. I've, I've I've taken a bunch of notes, and uh, that could be dangerous. But uh, uh, let us, let us just say that uh, uh, we are definitely seeing an increase in the amount and, and severity of uh, of storms in the last several years. I think it's pretty safe to say that the the debate over climate change is over, and and at this point, it doesn't really matter whether it's man-made or, or national phenomenon it's here and uh it's it's impacting how we deliver services in in the localities um let's face it nothing gets a board of supervisor more motivated to talk to a staff uh, than a midnight phone call from a resident complaining about his flooded house um, there are a number of themes that i think that we can take away from today um, one is that we all need to be looking at revising engineering uh, policies and guidance. Uh, to some degree, we're, we're paying for the sins of the past. Uh, you can't take a pipe, and, or you can't take a stream, pipe it on the ground, and then expect it to never reappear. Um, for those of you who don't know, the, the uh, commission, mainly myself here, is, is overseeing a grant project through the Chesapeake Bay Trust, working to develop all new predictive IDF curves for, for Northern Virginia. Um, that will be the beginning, hopefully, of some of the revisions that we can make to some of these engineering uh, guidelines. Uh, there is a, uh, a need for revised development and policies and guidance. Uh, several of the speakers talked about that. Uh, there's also a need for coordinated outreach and education, uh, and, and that education needs to be focused at a, at a level where people can actually understand it. Uh, right now, we know that the 100-year flood uh, is not really a 100-year flood anymore. Uh, statistically speaking, it's about a 66-year flood now. But to take it to a level that somebody can understand, if you tell a resident that his house is in the 100-year flood zone, that means nothing to him. But if you tell him the odds are that your house is going to flood once during the life of your 30-year mortgage, that has a different message to him. So some of these outreach messages have to be delivered at a level of understanding that the, the residents can deal with. Uh, we talked about FEMA mapping. Uh, for those of you who have an interest in Arlington and Paul's Church, uh, FEMA has already published, uh, there will be two meetings for community coordination and outreach in both of those jurisdictions. The Falls Church meeting is in October. The Arlington meeting, I believe, is in, in November. Um, hey, hey, Norm. All, yep. Hey, this is Brian Rollin, Alexandria. I just wanted to add to that. Our maps, our preliminary maps will be published tomorrow. Um, and we're scheduling our uh, community uh, coordination outreach meeting with FEMA right now. Great. So, you know, there's an example of, of how things that you need to stay on top of. Uh, the commission has been working with, with all those jurisdictions, most specifically within the Fall Mall Run watershed, because we maintain the Fall Mall Run model, and uh, that has become extremely useful for some of these map updates. Uh, Holly, at the very beginning, talked about uh, equity and social justice. Um, 
there there is to say I, I should say uh, that that is also going to be coming home. Social justice is going to be added to the scar scarring criteria uh, for Virginia's FEMA mitigation grant evaluations. I participated in a a, a stakeholder work group uh, about a month or two ago, and there's going to be about a ten criteria uh, evaluation just under that scarring of, of social justice. Um, I've been working with a, a number of the localities within the area on, on some flooding. And I think it's safe to say that there is no silver bullet. Uh, localities are gonna be, have to be looking at a combination of green infrastructure and gray inf infrastructure. We're seeing a, a change in, in the st stormwater paradigm. Uh, for the last 20 years, we've been focusing on water quality. Uh, water quantity really hasn't been dealt with since the, the late 80s and uh, in the early 90s for some areas in Virginia. We're going to have to change our focus. Uh, we're probably going to have to be looking at both. Uh, water quality is not going to go away, but at the same time, we're going to have to start addressing water quantity. And, and for some of you, that may, may mean a shift in terms of how you fund your programs. Um, Another another theme that came across to this uh, meeting today was the need for regional coordination. Um, I am happy to say that uh, I have been in conversation with uh, between uh, Corey and myself and, and the boss, and we are looking into trying to fund at least a partial position in the next year's fiscal budget to fund uh, a person for flooding outreach and education. And Kari's already put together a, a dynamite work program for that person. So this is not the last time this group will probably be getting together here in Northern Virginia with respect to flooding. Um, we'll be looking at it from a number of different standpoints, whether it's education or engineering or policy guidance. Uh, this group will probably be meeting more frequently than, than ever before in the past. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware right now that flooding is a major hot button topic in the Northern Virginia region, and it probably will be for, for the next several years. So those are the points that I took away from this meeting, and, and I'd love to hear from anyone that, that has any additional other points that they would like to bring up. I do have a few more questions that came in. Great. Go ahead and cover them, Corey. Okay. Uh, let's see. Mark Avini mentioned his experience with residents who may qualify for buyout programs, but some residents had no interest in moving. Um, this is a question for the group as we have talking about buyout programs. Any other identified obstacles they experienced other than resistant homeowners? Yeah, I've got a comment, uh, uh, Corey. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, so um, what we found was the following. So I, I mentioned this is Mark and Prince William. Some people did not want to move for whatever reason. Depending on where the people are uh, with their mortgage and, and so forth, because FEMA only allows up to 75% of the value in Northern Virginia, our home prices are much more than, you know, somewhere in the Midwest. So a lot of times it's very hard when somebody paid, you know, $400,000 or more for a house, um, even in a, in a more uh, lower income neighborhood, and they're told that FEMA is only going to pay them 75% of the um, assessed value. So that 25% difference is often a, a big deal for the kind of people that we're dealing with. Understood. Um, one other question has come in. Oh, go ahead. Who was speaking? This is Norm. I will also say that um, the buyout program uh, through FEMA, it's also very difficult to get that grant money. Um, they tend not to do the buyouts uh, as, as unless it's essentially a very highly repetitive flooded and there are no other options. 
Yes, and to Norm's point, this is Mark again. A lot of what we found with some of these residents is they don't claim um, they don't claim it on their insurance. They do the work themselves, either because they want to save money uh, or there's a, a fear of, of making a claim. So a lot of these houses that we know have flooded very often, uh, there's no record in FEMA of repetitive loss. Um, so we, we, we find that issue a lot, especially in your, your lower income uh, neighborhoods. And, and then one other point I would just make is the way the regulations are written at the federal level it prohibits local governments from making the match. So if, if you really wanted to buy out a home and FEMA only offers them 75%, we've often thought, well, what if the county put in the remaining 25% just to make them whole with general fund or other sources of income? And uh, FEMA does not allow that. So that, that is a, uh, a, an obstacle as well, that even local governments can't make up that difference. Mark, it's Demetra. If I could just add to that element, too, about people not reporting their repetitive loss, I think they're also concerned that insurance companies will start redlining the area. And if they redline the area, you know, selling their home is going to be difficult. Yep, there's, agree, there's many reasons. There's many reasons, yeah. Yep. Okay, um, here's another good question for you, Norm. Um, will NVRC be a voice in, oh, this is from Demetra. So I guess, Demetra, you can oh, go ahead and ask it yourself. So that way I don't have to read it. Demetra, can you hear us? Sorry, um, Norm, we all recognize that um, climate change is accelerating and it's also hastening the, the pace and the scale at which we need to make uh, infrastructure, quantity and capacity investments. But that's happening at the same time that of course our standards, our regulatory benchmarks are also increasing for water quality. Is, you know, we've been kind of noodling on this just theoretically and I don't pretend like we've really, you know, come up with any snappy solutions but we were hoping to start a regional conversation that might filter its way up to the you know, state and, as well as EPA on, can we establish criteria where a quantity project would, would be considered conventionally, conventionally a quantity project only, might be able to meet some kind of qualification for you know, water quality credit as well, so we can kind of double the use of our funds. Otherwise, we're just doubling down on the cost of the program. And, you know, obviously, in the era of COVID, we're more sensitive to that. Yeah, I, I see uh, you talking to Jason. <laughs> sorry? Uh, I said, I, I, I can see that you've been talking to Jason about this subject. Uh, yeah, the, the committee. Yeah, the I have been <laughs> yeah. talking to Jason about this subject. Yeah, I've, I've thrown it out there for great ideas. Yeah. The, uh, the commission is trying to open up a dialogue with, with all of those entities. Uh, we're gonna try to start working uh, locally first with, uh, with DEQ and get a conversation going with them. I've been trying to prime the pump here for about the last six months with DEQ, letting them know that the pace of implementation for water quality is probably gonna be somewhat hampered by our need to invest in water quantity. So mm -hmm. hopefully those conversations will, will kick off and we'll expand them to dealing with FEMA. Oh, Norm kind of fell off there. Okay, where, where did you hear me last? I, I uh, think it you, was, yeah. You kind of just said you were trying to move the discussion up to DEQ, but then you kind of just fell fell apart, fell away. I'm sorry. Apart. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sometimes my bandwidth gets a little squirrely around here. Um, what I was trying to say was that we'll be, um, I'm already holding conversations with DEQ on this subject. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been trying to let them know for the last six months or so that 
implementation for the TMDL is probably going to be slowed down and hampered somewhat by the need for some of that money to treat water quantity as opposed to water quality. So it would be best in their their own best interest to 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 assist us in trying to get some credits here for water quality through some of these detention facilities that we're going to have to be implementing to uh, to address flow. And uh, if we start locally, then we'll expand the conversation to hopefully Region Three and the Bay Program and and FEMA. Yeah, that would be great because um, obviously we're all trying to fit 15 pounds of potatoes into a three and a half pound bag. Exactly. And I can also add that um, the state through the governor's office is doing a, uh, a coastal resiliency master plan to uh -huh. address uh, recurrent flooding in the coastal zone. Um, now, most of that, most of, of what they're addressing, I believe, is uh, tidal flooding, um, sunny day flooding um, types of, of events, which we don't experience that much in Northern Virginia. But I think there should be, um, you know, a lot of emphasis on these projects that achieve these multiple benefits. Um, that's sort of their buzzword at, at DEQ is how do you get how do you get multiple benefits out of out of a single project and they're going to be placing a lot of in, um, emphasis on green infrastructure types of projects uh, so that plan should be uh, released in the coming weeks um i have not seen uh, a draft of it but there uh is um uh, a framework that should be coming av available and as soon as that comes out um i can forward that on to everyone to make sure that you have a chance to look at it um it's ann phillips at the uh governor's office is, is putting it together. Thank you. And Demetra asked if we could have access to PDS, PDFs of the other presentations. And I think the answer will be yes. Thank you again. Uh, you're welcome. So that's it for questions, um, at least what I have here in my, my question box. Norm, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, I think that's about it. It looks like we've got about two minutes left on the schedule. I want to I wanna thank everyone who, who attended today. Um, uh, we had a, about 50 people at one point, I believe. It just shows you uh, the the importance of this subject uh, that's on everyone's mind right now, and uh, we will we welcome the the additional dialogue uh, that you may have. Feel free to email Corey or, or myself or both of us, um, and hopefully we'll be put like I said we'll be putting together some kind of of regional program uh, together starting next fiscal year. Uh, just keep your fingers crossed that we can get it funded, and uh, that's about it. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great thank rest you. of your day. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.